but yeah. but it is I, I do get it that like all right we're lot. going we're going live let's see how this goes um moshi can you watch it from your end i'm i'm looking i'm looking um refreshing the page so after college my brother and i lived in jamaica for a while not like like jamaica that means oh yeah, yeah. that's cool i like uh jamaica's all right yeah it's pretty good oh we're good all right, so we're actually live streaming at the moment. If you guys are ready to go, I'm going to switch over to the screen. I believe they can hear our audio because I am still learning. Yeah, they're, they're up. Everyone can hear. I'm, okay, okay, so I'm here done. we go. I'm going to go ahead and switch it over. Billy, it's all yours. Okay, guys. Um, I'm Billy Flake, Director of Opera Operations for Stephen Comics. Today I'm joined by Matt Rose, a uh, prestigious Marvel writer. Yeah. Prestigious? Sure. I'll, I'll take it. So Matt, I mean, you, you start, what was your first Marvel book that you wrote? Uh, my first Marvel book, I wrote a 10-page short story in Secret Wars Journal Number 1. I'm sure everybody at home remembers that. Uh, it's a pretty important comic. Um, but yeah, I wrote, uh, I wrote an X-Men 10-pager that tied into um, the Secret Wars event that was like a weird alternate universe thing, and uh, it was fun. So those were your first years of Marvel, but what, what, was, what was your, what was your entry to comics? I guess? Like, where did it really begin? As a, as a creator or as a fan? Uh, let's, start, let's start with creator and go backwards to fan. Okay, we'll go backwards to my life. Uh, you know, I started, I, I always wanted to work at, at Marvel and, and, you know, DC and, and do like the big superhero stuff because I grew up on that stuff. But um, I started off and I was, I knew that I had to have stuff out there and get noticed, so I, I did a I did a bunch of self published stuff that was pretty um, hard to get a hold of unless you knew me. But I, I just wanted stuff to sort of send to editors and and show around and sort of practice. And I had a, a short lived web comic um, that that was pretty fun. And then my first real break, I did a I did a book um, with Riza and Zoda Space Killer from the Wu Tang Clan. Uh, called 12 Reasons to Die that was like a tie-in to Ghostface's record and that was from oh there you go, there you go. Um, yeah I did I, I, I wrote that with those guys and, and my buddy Patrick Finland. Um, we wrote this book together and it was sort of you know that they came to me to be like you know did you want to do this so then I had this book and sort of shopped at different publishers and had a bunch of meetings and Black Mass, uh, was a publisher that I knew and they were just starting and hadn't put anything out yet. So I brought it to them and they were super excited. So that was my first published, like, in comic shop comic. So, uh, so you did the end of the end of the stuff and then what was it like getting in and doing tomorrow? It was awesome. Um, like I said, like, I'm a, I'm a lifelong, you know, superhero guy, Marvel guy. So it, it was pretty... It was pretty much a dream come true for me. I think that the funniest part was like um, the the first thing I did was this pen paper and it was for like I said, Secret Wars Journal. And and they said to me, they were like, your your story takes place in New Egyptia, um, which you know I knew what it was because the New Warriors run like, has a history of two arts there, so they go there and um, they're like, you can do whatever you want. Like it's this is the only time we're really going to see this world like this different section of the Marvel Universe to do whatever you want. And I was like, okay, I want to do X-Men. And they were like, okay, that's fine. And it was all going smoothly. And I, I sent them the script and the opening page is like a, a splash page. And there's, there's I think, 28 X-Men on the page. And uh, my artist, uh, Luca Pizzari, who's, who's a great artist and stuff, he sent a note to me and the editor. And he was like, most of these characters don't appear in the story and they don't talk. It's like, can we cut this down a little? Like, why are they all the page? And my editor called and was like, yeah, why did you put so many characters on this page? And I was like, I just don't know if I'm ever going to get to write the X-Men again. So I just wrote as much as I could into it. Uh, and he was like, all right, that's a fair enough reason. So the opening page of the book is a brutal splash page of just as many characters as I could put on a page. Uh, very mean to my artist, but that was like, that was my start. So, so now we both know, know that obviously that was not the, the Latin literate yet, right? Yeah. 
right? Yeah, well, I did my first real X-Men thing after that. I did the Phoenix Resurrection a couple of years ago. Um, this is like five issues, five over five issues, sort of bringing Green back. Um, and that was really fun. And, and from there, Marvel was like, you know, they, Marvel is very excited about it. It, it. it performed better than they expected, I think. And editorially, they were very into it. And so that was sort of my like, good job. What do you want to do next kind of thing? And uh, from there, I went to Multiple Man, which was sort of a passion project of mine because I, I just love the character. And by the time Multiple Man was happening, I was already starting, by the time Multiple Man came out, I was starting on New Mutants and Astonishing X-Men and, and yeah, and then I met to Uncanny with, with Kelly and Ed and uh, then by myself after that. So yeah, a lot of X-Men in, in three years, like all in 60, 70 issues of X-Men stuff. No, that's, that, that's also crazy. I, uh, I'll say my name is X-Men, like I love, love the X-Men more than anything, so. Um, I've read a, a ton of what you've written. Let's a little bit about what, where did you get started with comics? Like the first time you were like, oh, this is a comic book. That's the best part in the movie. Yeah, the, um, I have an older brother um, who, who was buying comics, and and his rule was like, you know, don't, don't touch my comics. Don't ever look at my comics, um, which is pretty much his rule for everything. I was a kid and you know I was like four or five and, and he would go out and I would immediately go into his room and start reading his comics and that was it like for me literally the, the you know I was learning to read on on you know the Dark Phoenix saga and, and you know Chris Claremont X-Men like me sitting there sounding out words and trying to figure out what they meant and uh yeah I just never lost that sort of love of comics I grew up I grew up in New York City and um, we had a comic shop on my block growing up. Um, you know, I, I know that like so many people tell the story of like, oh yeah, I had a comic shop and it was, you know, so many miles from my house and, you know, I'd have to beg my parents, but it was like, for me, the comic shop was the first place I was allowed to go by myself because my mom could watch me from our apartment window, like walk across the street to a comic book store. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just, that was like my, that was my, my place like my, my local comic shop was, was the best and i both my parents were writers that's what, that's what they did for a living so they're you know like uh being a being a writer sometimes you have uh, good years and bad years and lean times but uh you know their rules stuff so for us is when we were kids always was like you know you, you can have an allowance sometimes sometimes we didn't have an allowance you know we couldn't afford some stuff but they were always like if you want a book We'll figure out how to get it for you because they wanted to encourage us to read because they're writers and uh somehow um my parents were were progressive enough to realize that comic books are books and so um yeah that was i was very abusive of that policy but i i had a big pull list at my local shop when i was like nine on and, uh you know just read everything so are you still active? Like, what are you reading during the quarantine? Oh man, I read. Uh, I read about a trade a night. So uh, every night. I mean, that's not that's not quarantine. Day, that's just regular. Um, let me see. Uh, last night I was reading some Amazing Spider-Man. Um, for like older stuff, I was reading uh, like the Grim Hunt and stuff, like 2011, 2012 stuff. I was reading Spider-Man Fever, the Brendan McCarthy, uh, like weird psychedelic Spider-Man. I read that. I just read Mr. Miracle. I finally read Mr. Miracle, like Tom and Mrs. Yeah. Miracle. Uh, yeah, I had I bought the first two issues and were immediately was just like, oh, this is gonna read better in a collection. What's up? Um, so I put it aside and waited and, and finally was like, well, it's time to read it. Why, so, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, it was awesome. And uh, what else did I read? I read uh, AMA, A-A-M-A, like a French.
it's not my kid. I don't care if I corrupt him. Uh, the thing I, I, you know, for kids walking the bank, my my yeah. book is sort of so like the a only reason I, I feel like is because I can cancel a lot of people who don't know comics. Um, you know, like there's some Marvel stuff. Like uh, the Punisher is pretty straightforward, but it's like kind of a tough read. <laughs> you have to be a certain type of person to appreciate the Punisher. And X Men stuff is always sort of clouded in X Men lore, and and you know, like some of the stuff is more or less accessible, but. I, I always like giving people something that they can just read and pick up and it's contained. And, uh, you know, for the Bronx, no bank is that for me. So. I think I think the, the first thing I ever explained it was a man in lawn. I thought it was great. And and then the next thing I turned around, it was like our mobs are like, oh, here are four Matt Rosenberg of this month. And it's just like, who's Matt Rosenberg? Trying to go learn about this guy because clearly he's doing something right. Yeah, yeah. It was a. Uh, I, 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 my first Marvel stuff was before four kids. I did a book called We Can Never Go Home at Black Mass, and a bunch of the, a bunch of the Marvel editors were fans. So I done, uh, I did that that Secret Wars Eternal thing, and I did a um, a Quake one shot, the only Quake comic that exists, but it's for the Shield anniversary uh, thing. But I did a Quake one shot with Daniel Warren Johnson on art. Um, that was my first like full issue. And then I think I've done like I started on Kingpin right when Fortress Walk No Bank started and I did an issue of Black Canary at DC. Um, but yeah, like right when Four Kids was coming out, Marvel like really like they were excited about the book and excited about me. And so there was a time when yeah, I suddenly was doing a lot of stuff. Uh, which I, I I talk to people a lot who are like, yeah, suddenly you were just doing all this stuff. And it never feels that way to me because I know, like, you know, some stuff I was working on for a year and some stuff I've been working on for a month. And, you know, there's hundreds of pages of things that no one ever really read and stuff like that. So it doesn't feel that sudden to me. But I guess that uh, in 2017 or 16 or 18 or whatever, I was suddenly on a bunch of stuff, surprisingly. You, you say you say you grew up in New York. I think you said you still live in New York City. Yes. Uh, how, how are you are you handling being stuck inside and what precaution are you taking? Um, well, I'm a comic book writer, so I don't really go outside anyway. <laughs> um, it, it's a. Uh, I think I'm I'm genetically built for this. Like I, I live with my girlfriend, and she's kind of, you know, going a little stir crazy. I mean, she's also trapped in here with me. But uh, most days, you know, if I didn't live with someone else, I I. I don't go outside a lot of days anyway, so it's not that much of a change. It just means that like I can't get food at the Indian restaurant around the corner for me now. And uh, the, the big outing that I would normally do every week is going to a comic shop. So that's a big change for me. But other than that, I mean, you know, I, I know it's horrific and horrible out there and, and really tough on people, but I kind of just stay in my room anyway. So fair enough. Uh, so, you know, we talked a lot about, about you've written X-Men, you've written Punisher, uh, yeah. uh, Quake, King, 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 um, you've done some of your enemy stuff. If you could pick uh, another character, somebody that, that you more obscure that somebody hasn't really touched in a while, if you want to kind of revitalize. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, I love those characters. There's a lot of characters that I, you know, like, for me, you know, I, I know for a lot of people, like, they're always like, oh, X-Men, you know, like, Storm and Jean Grey and Cyclops and Wolverine and, and like I love those characters but for me like I was always like yeah Magic and Havoc and Multiple Man and um, I, I like a lot of the more obscure the the if there's a character at Marvel that I would really love to do uh, be Mr. Immortal um, from the Great Lakes Avengers uh, I just like he's a favorite of mine and I awesome. love. I love the original Great Lakes Avengers, and and like I think he's he's a character who you know he's he's from a comedy book and sort of a punchline, and um, but and like doesn't have to be is a more versatile character than that, and like I think it's a really interesting thing. Like uh, when I was a kid, Wolverine, I really loved Wolverine, um, but he was a very different kind of Wolverine than he is now. Like he was kind of not really a great. Like you sort of got the impression that he wasn't particularly tough or strong or a great fighter. It's right. just he's just the dude that when you knock him down, he always gets back up. Amazing. Yeah, and it, it it's just like 
that's kind of terrifying to be like, well, he, he's not going to be stronger than most people in a fight. He's not a better fighter than them, but like he literally just won't ever stop. And that to me, it was like why I was fascinated by Wolverine when I was a kid. And now, you know, we know he's like an immortal ninja that can do all these things. And that's cool. And he's a, but he's just a very different thing. But I feel like um, Mr. Immortal has the potential to be that character again of like the guy that it's just like, well, he's doesn't have any other powers other than like if you shoot him in the head he's gonna stand back up in a minute and that's terrifying <laughs> like uh, so i really like him but i don't know there's a bunch i mean there's always characters that i i think are 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 due for you know i i love us agent i would love to do more with us agent he's just you know that would be awesome that would be great yeah he's you know like all all those like mark brunwald era captain america characters are just stunningly good and and really versatile and i think us agent is is one of the great marvel characters and so i'd love to do more him and uh i don't know there's a there's a ton there's always people that i would like to spend more time with well even if it's just outside of marvel because there's something you'd like, like to put dc or better better question from our our, our fans watching on facebook uh, who's your favorite character that you've gotten work on my favorite character that i've gotten to work on um Havoc or Magic, like from the X Men, both of them were my were my favorites when I was young, and I, I think they're both just great, um, really versatile characters, really like subtle and and nuanced, and and sort of a different side of of the Marvel universe than than you see a lot, and sort of a different side of superheroes. I mean, I think especially a character like Havoc, like there's just a lot of interesting sort of subtext and and stuff about being Cyclops' little brother and being you know, growing up in the shadow of a superhero team and then being a part of that and what it means. Like, it's, it's just really fascinating to me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I love working on them. Uh, Daredevil and Moon Knight are two dream characters of mine. I've done, you know, Moon Knight was in a little bit of Punisher and uh, Daredevil too. Like, I, I drop Daredevil and Moon Knight into stuff whenever I can, but those are characters that I really love writing. And... Um, Characters that I haven't, there aren't a lot of Marvel characters at this point that I haven't at least done a page or two on. Um, I've never written, have I? I don't think I've ever written Bruce Banner or Hulk. I wrote uh, in the Quake story, when I pitched it, I was like, yeah, it's Quake with the Avengers and it's the Hulk. And they were like, no, when she was with the Avengers, it was the Red Hulk. And I was like, oh, damn. So I wrote Red Hulk, but I don't think I've ever written Bruce. Um, and I would love to, uh, but uh, I mean, do you keep up with modern Marvel stuff? Stuff I mean, kind of have to, right? Because it kind of interacts with your storyline. Yeah. 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 Um, so are you reading like a Mohawk and stuff like that? Yeah, that's yeah. that's amazing. Uh, Al is Al is a genius and and uh, so Al's funny because he's like one of the smartest people I know. He just gets things on a level that other people don't. Um, but but the Hulk is like a weird sweet spot for him where it's like. It, it, that book works on so many levels where it's like, well, it's just this great weird horror book. And then it's like, well, it's also this like meta meditation on all these like bizarre themes that are out. It, it, it really is a, yeah, it's one of my favorite books right now for sure. Um, so what is there anything you can talk about, talk about maybe what you're, you're working on, working on next? I mean... uh, no, I don't think I can talk about what I'm working on. Next. Okay. Um, That's fair. I have, a bunch of a bunch of projects at Marvel. Um, one that I think we're going to hear about soon. One that I don't know when we're going to hear about, and one that is like a ways off that I'm really excited about. Um, and then a bunch of little things that I'm talking to them about. But I don't think I can talk about any of it. I, like the only things I think I'm allowed to talk about are, are Hawkeye and Force Works, which are both currently out sure. and currently paused. So. Uh, when comics resume, those books will resume. So how did, with Hawkeye, what, because I'm really enjoying that book as well, like what, when you sat down to, to do that and um, like, I mean, Fraction did first, right? And then with this, kind of this Hawkeye, right? It, yeah. So, so what, 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 was your, what was your thinking? Okay, I've got to follow up behind that Fraction now. Now, like what, what, what are you going to do? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's the weird thing for me is like, I think it's the, the, the fun challenge of Hawkeye is that like Hawkeye's not a big, you know, I, I know it sounds weird because he's an Avenger and he's in the movies. And everyone's like, oh, Jeremy Renner. But it is, it is really not a big book or title. 
Um, and Marvel is very clear on that. Like they're like, if not, you know, there's always going to be a Spider-Man book. There's always going to be, you know, an X-Men or a, a whatever. Like those books have to exist. Hawkeye is a book that they sort of hold on to for when someone, you know, a certain type of creator comes on with an idea. And and the I, I'm a fan of Hawkeye my whole life. I love the Mark Grunewald mini and and you know Solo Avengers, Avengers Spotlight was like one of my favorite books when I was a kid. So it's like I, I've just always liked Hawkeye, but obviously when when Matt Fraction and David Aha and Hollingsworth and all those guys and uh, came in and did their Hawkeye thing, it was like very revolutionary. Um, not just for the character, but sort of for Marvel and, and what it meant and what you did with the character. Um, which presents like this very weird, unique problem because, you know, I could go in and do, me and Otto Schmidt could have done, you know, a cover band version of what they did and done an impression and everyone would have felt like, oh, it's kind of like the thing we like. It's kind of, you know, and you would have, uh, you know, it, it would have been passable, I think. I think I could probably imitate it enough that some people would enjoy it. Uh, I think Otto could do that too. But like, that's not playing to our strength. But more than that, I think, I think the legacy of what Matt and David really did on Hawkeye is like radically reinvent what the book is and what it could be. And I think it's so rare in comics that you have like that title and that kind of thing where you're like, this book is always going to be the out there book. It's always going to be a little different and a little weird. And uh, so uh, I thought I, I spent a long time thinking about it and I was like, well, I think if I want to pay tribute to what they did and really acknowledge it, the, the smart move is to reinvent it again. Like that's, that's actually their legacy is, is the reinvention. Um, it's not where they ended. It's, it's the process. So, yeah, so so my pitch to Marvel was like, look, it's going to be a little bit of what they did, a little bit of Grunwald, a little bit of what you know uh, Jeff Lemire and Ramon Perez did, a little bit of what Kelly Thompson did on Hawkeye, taking all these different elements of Hawkeye and and trying to make something new, something that's you know not about a superhero in his downtime. It's not about just straight being an Avenger. It, it's a mix of all these things. It's it's a comedy, but it's also really screwed up and. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was sort of our, my pitch was like, we have to keep it pushing forward and keep it fresh and keep it different. And I, I feel like we did a pretty good job. I, I feel like it doesn't, if your Hawkeye book reads like another Hawkeye book at this point, like you failed, it has to always feel different. Um, so, so I feel like we did a, we did a decent job on that. People seem to like it. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, what is, so can, can you mention that stay inside your comic book writer? Uh, uh, what do you think are some, some of the challenges of like what you do? What are the challenges of what I do? Yeah, besides sitting down and having to be creative and entertainable month after month. But, I mean, regularly that's the challenge. I mean, it's not, you know, not building buildings. It's not like laboriously hard. It's just about sort of trying to think of things that are, uh, that are interesting, that are, that are find things that are going to entertain people. Um, it, it's 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 a very unique sort of skill set, and um, you know, I, I don't want to diminish other work. I've had real jobs that were like, you know, you come home and you're sore and you're tired, and they were really hard, and uh, you know, you, you can get injured. And comics isn't that at all. I mean, especially not for a writer. Not a lot of writers are getting injured in comics, but. Um, it is it is a weirdly tiring, exhausting sort of thing, just like pushing your brain, like mental gymnastics all the time. And I think I think you're gonna if you talk to a lot of comic creators now, like you know we're all sort of reclusive in our own way, but we all sort of stay in touch a lot. So I talk to a lot of comics writers, um, and I think like the current situation, uh, a lot of us are finding that you know the the limits of that like the you need to be in a good mental health space like you can't be um depressed you can't be miserable you have to sort of be able to like put all that stuff aside and i think a lot of people trapped in their houses and you know not being able to to go for a walk and clear their heads not being able to like go out to a movie or or go out go to a bar for a drink uh, like is really uh uh showing a lot of a lot of concentrators like how much mental 
fitness sort of it takes right now. Right. So do you ever run into issues where you have like writer's blah blah or you can't like like you know figure out how this 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 hook and story is going to work and and if, and if we run into those kind of those kind of we we've got a, a lot of people in our shops and they, and they ask about the creator creator process. So I think this is kind of an opportunity that I like, questions I get asked I'm going to have to ask. So what, what yeah. do you have to do about that? You know, I think, uh, yeah, of course. Um, you know, I, uh, I was on a panel once with uh, Grant Morrison, and they asked us both, like, what, what, uh, you know, what's your process and how do you deal with, like, writer's block and stuff like that? And Grant gave a flawless Grant Morrison answer, which I will butcher, but it was, you know, along the lines of... Uh, him saying how he you know doesn't believe in writer's block and he sits down at a computer and you know starts typing and types until he's done and the words just flow out of him and I, I'm, I'm sure that's true and um that's just not how my brain works uh i sort of fight my way through every page i sort of it's a struggle like you know every every word on a page is is wrestled with and, and fought over and and um you know, for a while, I never, I wouldn't like to admit that because I felt like sort of amateurish by being like, no, it's really hard to write. Like, I, I really have to like fight to get through a script. But, but I, I realized like, you know, it's, it's the end result that matters. It's not, uh, it's not the process. And you know, no one needs to come into my house and see me like slapping myself in the head and screaming. They can just read the comic at the end. But you know, like the, the writer's block thing. Um, I saw Brian K. Vaughan get asked this once and, and he had an answer that I, I think is, is the best possible answer, which is that, you know, again, I'm going to paraphrase, but um, he sort of didn't acknowledge that writer's block is a thing. Um, writing is hard and there are hard parts where you're stuck. It, it's not, writing isn't just the act of putting the story down or punching the keys. It's all of it. It's figuring it out. And when you give, stepping away from his answer like uh, I, I feel like when you when you say writer's block that's that's reductive and 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 diminishing of what it is which is like it's part of writing like you're gonna have times when it's really hard you're gonna have things that you can't figure out how to work um it's not that's not something that gets in the way of writing that's part of writing and i i think that you know uh, it's like anything like you see a baseball player and, and, and you say, like, wow, it must be awesome that you get to hit a ball and play catch all the time. It's, well, that's not actually the whole job. The whole, he also has to work out all the time and practice 80 hours a week and, you know, eat right and all these things. And that stuff's not fun. Getting stuck and getting frustrated and not being able to write is the not glamorous part of writing, but it's still part of the job. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, I think when you realize that and figure out that like you're going to have days where you don't put down anything on a page and you just stare at it for eight hours and you're frustrated and mad and you, you know, need to go for a walk or go for a run or just, you know, have a drink or whatever it is, watch a movie to try and clear your head and, and reset. Like that's just part of it. And, and you can't beat yourself up for, for the difficult part any more than, you know, you beat yourself up if you had another job and you're tired and, and before work or, you know, part of your job is hard. Like that, that's just the job. You did mention that, mention that a little bit, or that you've had that other jobs, the writing comics. Um, yeah. This is a two part question. If you could have, if you, if you're going to do if you, any other job, wasn't writing in comics, what would it be? Um, I mean, I guess writing movies is kind of a cop out answer. Uh, you know, I'd love to. I'd love to be in a band. I spent years like touring with bands, tour managing bands, and you know, teching and selling merch and all the crappy things that are involved with being in a touring band without having musical talent. <laughs> so I'd like to see what it was like to actually have the talent. Um, that that's always a job that I've liked and. You know, it, it not not be like a rock star or anything. I have no interest in that. But like, just play in a working band would be cool. Um, yeah, that's probably my answer. So we have a question from Facebook. Um, I know you do you do some mentions. What what's been your favorite convention and your favorite convention experience? experience? 
Oh man, uh, there's a lot of awesome conventions. Um, I did Comic Con India uh, and flew to India. I was in India for 70 hours, which is intense because it's a 22 hour flight. Um, and that was so culturally different that it was kind of awesome. Um, it was, uh, you know, right before I went, I talked to a couple of the other writers. I think uh, I went out to dinner with Charles Soule and Nick Spencer, and they'd both done it. And I was like, what do I expect? And they were like, most people won't have any idea who you are or what you do. They're still going to be excited you're there. <laughs> and uh, you're going to sign all day, every day. And I was like, what do I sign? And they were like, anything they have on them. And that was exactly what it was that like, I sat there and the convention made like X-Men posters and Orchids Walk No Bank posters. And I was like, you know, just give them out. I don't know who's going to buy these. Like, I have no idea. And they were like, no, we'll sell them. And they sold them for like the equivalent of like 10 cents or 20 cents, like super cheap. And we, we would sit down at, at nine in the morning and I would start signing. And at 1 p.m. I'd have a lunch break. And at eight o'clock I could go back to the hotel. And, but from nine to eight, with an hour in the middle, I was just signing my name over and over and over again. But like, it was crazy because like people would come up and be like, oh, I'm a huge fan. And they wouldn't have any idea who you were. And they'd be like, I'm a huge fan. Uh, thank you for creating the X-Men. And I'd be like, I didn't create, okay, yeah. And then someone else would come up and be like, I'm a huge fan. And you'd be like, okay, yeah. And you just like get used to it. And then like every 50th person would be like, oh, I'm a huge fan. And you'd be like, thank you. And they'd be like, I'm a little unclear if extermination takes place during Uncanny. Or, and you'd be like, oh, you actually do read the books. And, and so it was really fun to sort of like mentally figure out what's going on. And, you know, it was a very cool country and good food. Uh, that was a favorite of mine. Um, I always loved Kiro's Con. Uh, in, in North Carolina, uh, New York Comic Con is my hometown show, so I love them. And, yeah, there's a ton. Um, there are very few Comic Cons I've been to that are bad, to be honest. I just kind of like being around people who like comics. Right. So it's like, you know, even the worst Comic Con I've ever been to, I still had fun and bought a bunch of stuff and hung out with people. So, so let me ask you that you, it's kind of a loaded question, but do you, but do you have an uh, opinion, opinion on? Digital comics versus the direct market. Um, I have a lot of opinions on that. Personally, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think comics. I think a huge obstacle for comics is accessibility. There are a lot of people who don't know about comic shops, don't have them in their shop, don't have them in the town, can't get to them, and it's just comics as a whole is like one of the last things where like you're sort of expected to go to a place, let alone every week. Like I don't go to the supermarket every week, but I go to the comic shop every week. And it's, it's a very ritualistic thing. And that's what I love about comics. But I think it's also a barrier for a lot of people who are just like, you know, especially people who are like, yeah, I buy a video game system and then I download my video games. I watch my movies on demand, but I, I'm expected to go out and buy a physical thing. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very niche thing, but at the same time, you know, the hope, and I think it would be, uh, you know, the ideal in my mind is that like digital comics is an entry point for people to fall in love with the comic shop and the comic store and comic collecting, which is, is I think the heart of comics. And I think, um, and I think it should work that way. I think it should be a gateway. I mean, it definitely works that way now in music. If you go into a record store, you're going to find kids who grew up on MP3s who are collecting vinyl now. And, and like, they appreciate that and they understand it. And I mean, it's the same, you know, there's a difference between the movie theater going experience and the home experience. And, and you know, people grow up with on demand and Netflix, but they're not, not going to movies. Um, with all that said, you know, like, I, and yeah, I hope that digital comics could be a gateway for people to discover physical comics. With all that said, um, I kind of hate digital comics. Um, I don't read comics. I have an iPad. I don't really ever turn it on unless I have to. I buy everything. Um, even at work for 
you know, Marvel, I'll do stuff and, and they'll say like, you have to brush up on this or read this. And they mail me, you know, they email me PDFs. They'll email me like 60 issues. And I just type up the list and I go down to my local comic shop and I buy all the issues and read them because I don't want to read. I don't want to stare, you know, I spent my day job is staring at a computer screen for 12 hours and I want to have a book and hold it and, you know, so... I think digital comics are great if that's what you're into. It's just not, I didn't grow up on them and it's not my thing. Sure. I, one of the things we, we talked about Hawkins, Hawkins earlier and then one of the things he said is like, it's, first it takes the collectability out of, out of the industry. Sure. You can't collect digital comics really. And then, you know, when you, when you we talked about like Heroes Con and, and even India Comic Con, um, what are they bring pad or their laptop to get you to sign? You know? yeah. So that's something you, you kind of lose that as well. I have signed iPads. Um, have you really? Yeah, yeah, I think two. Um, once I was the only person, and I, it was the first person who asked me to do it, and I was like, you want me to write on your iPad? And they're like, well, on the back. And I was like, but why? And they're like, well, I read your books. And I was like, that's weird. But then someone else had, like, all these people do it. And I was like, okay, that makes, I guess, more sense. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 my feeling is, like, comics is a, a medium. Like, I, you shouldn't have to say that it's collectible. Like, you don't have to be a film student to like go see sure. a movie. like if you want to read a cool story it's a cool story no one like there's book collectors but they're that's not where who most books are sold to right but the problem is that comics are not are a lot harder to get there's just less comic shops than there are bookstores and and you know there's the giant evil entity that is amazon that's like not really great for selling comics and so there's a barrier to teaching people about comics. And I think, you know, I think anything we can get to overcome that barrier and put comics in people's hands is good because eventually some percentage of those people are going to then find comics from. And I think that should be the end goal. So, okay, I, I, I just have to ask because because you signed iPods apparently. What's the, or iPads apparently, what's the weirdest thing, thing you ever signed? I mean, I don't think it's that. Uh, I signed someone's baby, uh, which I thought was funny. And then people were like, that's kind of messed up. But I was like, it's not permanent. I just like wrote on them. They'll wash their kid, right? Um, but the uh, the weirdest one for me when I was when I was starting, I did I did a book called We Can Never Go Home, and a bunch of people got We Can Never Go Home tattoos, and and were really excited about it, and that was very flattering. And a, uh, a woman came up to me and she was like, hey, would you sign my arm? And I, I said, yeah. And right as I got the pen up, she was like, I'm going to get it tattooed. And I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. And she was like, what? And I was like, that's weird. <laughs> so there's a lot of cool art in the book. If you want to get art from a book I did, like artists make it. My signature is just basically my initials. It's gross looking. Like, you don't want that on your plate forever. And she was like, I was just kidding. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, really? And she was like, yeah. And I signed her arm. And then she came to the con the next day with the fresh tattoo of my signature. And I was like, God damn it. So, um, so they're still running around. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. She could have cut her arm off, but uh, <laughs> I probably would. But, you know, she, uh, yeah, that was the weirdest one for sure for me. So we have, uh, we have some Facebook engagement. Um, you mentioned earlier that you, uh, you, you worked with some touring bands. And really, if you could do something else, maybe you'd be a musician. Uh, what what's your, what's your favorite band or genre of music here? You're really passionate about. I mean, I grew up like uh, I used to run a record label, and I, I grew up as like a punk and hardcore kid. So that's sort of my my wheelhouse, and uh, you know, indie rock and punk rock, and um, you know, when I toured with bands, it was not like touring in buses. I mean, I toured in buses sometimes, but it wasn't like arenas and stadiums. It was like basements and legion halls. And, and that's kind of the stuff I love. Um, my favorite band of all time is Faith No More. Um, they're just the band that like sort of got me really excited about music when I was a little kid. And I think they're, you know, sort of something that creatively I, I aspire to do, which is just constantly sort of reinventing themselves and being fearless and like, you know, uh, putting their own interests sort of above the audience and being like, we're going to do things we think are cool and come along or don't. And, and like, because they constantly challenge themselves, they're a band that like, you know, they'll put out stuff that people aren't into and then they'll put out the next thing and they are because they're always just sort of entertaining themselves. And so it never gets stale, which I think is really inspiring. Um, but they're like a weird non-genre band. You know, I, my, my favorite stuff is like, 
know, punk hardcore stuff. Okay. Uh, so my next question, I may have I heard this or heard it or I, I might have dreamed it up. Uh, is it true that you're straight straight edge? I am, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and my whole, uh, not my whole life. I turned, uh, I became straight edge when I was 14. So uh, most of my life, but uh, yeah, I just grew up, you know, I grew up, I went to a all boys Catholic school and I was like, you know, the kid with dyed hair and piercings and, you know, I got, got beat up and shoved down the stairs and all that stuff. And um, it, to me, I, there was just a point in my life where like, I realized that like me and all my friends were like going out and, you know, like they were trying to score drugs and then drink. And then like all the kids who'd go and beat me up were doing the exact same thing, like all the jocks and all the bullies and whatever. And I was just like, why are we into the same thing? Like that doesn't make sense to me that like, you know, in, in the school, there's this huge divide right? and this is the guy who's going to like hit me with a bat. And then outside of school, we're like all doing the same stuff. And I, that to me, when I found out about straight edge when I was a little kid, I was like, oh, that makes sense to me. Like reject all this stuff that all these people I don't like do. And since then, you know, I just grew up and, you know, I think it, like socio-politically, it's had a lot of sort of made a lot of sense for me always. I, I, you know, a lot of people I think are straight edge when they're young and sort of lose the thread and don't see the point anymore. And I understand that, but like, as I grew up, I sort of, my interest changed and like, you know, I was more interested in politics and political activism and, and the connection to straight edge and theirs is a, I think a pretty straight line and um, things like that. So that was kind of a long boring answer for yeah, straight edge. No, 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 that's cool. That's great. That because I, I a lot of stuff was gonna be like like follow up stuff. Like, well, why? why? And no, oh, yeah. we're, we're getting on to that. that. Um, let's see. We've got some other uh, engagement. Let's see what we got. Sorry, I look like a, a monster. I, I'm doing like real full isolation beard kind of thing, and that's like oh, I should probably like, clean myself up. And then I was like, no, let's do like me who hasn't gone outside in six weeks. So you got full my dirty apartment and my dirty self. No, I was actually, actually while we've been talking, I've been, I've been kind of making your, your back, back to drop the bookshelf. There's the, the plant here with like, like a heart floating on it. Yeah, there's a little heart on it. Uh, my girlfriend, uh, we had a Christmas tree and we took it down. And so she put decorations from the Christmas tree on our sad little calamari plant. Yeah, I think maybe. Yeah, I think maybe you can see the only piece of original art I own. Yeah, what is that? Uh, it's a page Bendis drew, Brian Bendis drew for uh, Jinx, page from Jinx. Oh. Yeah, it's the only page of original art I own. Oh. Okay, very cool. What, so, have been collecting comics, you said, since you were around nine years old. Well, what is your grail book, like, just for the, the comics fans out there? Oh, you know, like, I'm not... Man, I don't know. I, I, uh, for me, probably the, the like, I'm not like a single issue guy anymore. Like, I gave it up a long time ago. I read trades. Um, so a lot of it is not like, you know, like I have a lot of the old out of print, like Alan Moore stuff and, and stuff like that. But like, there's not a lot of like trades that people are like, oh, that's so exciting that you have that. It just doesn't really work that way. Um, but, uh, you know, I have all the old um, The Eclipse, uh, The Color Akira's, like a complete run of that. Yeah, those, are, those are awesome. Yeah, which I, I love. And sort of that's always something when, when like other comics people come and crash on my couch, they're always like, damn. And they always want to read them. And I'm like, that's one. Like, normally I'm like, yeah, it's a book, just read it. And that's one where I'm like, just be delicate with those. They're like very old and kind of <laughs> Um But when I was a kid, a big thing to me, I saved up. Uh, I saved up for nine months to be able to buy the first appearance of the Punisher. Awesome. Uh, when I was like 12, 13. Um, and my comic shop, who really uh, were very kind to me, cut me, were like, we'll cut you a deal and give it to you for half price because you're a good customer. And so it took me nine months of like really like, you know, uh, being being as stingy as possible, like no no Skittles, no nothing to get it. And I still have that, like the copy that was mine when I was a little kid. So that's probably like my most dear comic. No, that's absolutely awesome. It's ASM 129 if you guys are watching at home. 
there. Uh, yeah. I actually, uh, I didn't set this up. We're just at my home my home office. Today. So here was my URL. I got, I got it. Uh, just actually this oh, year. That's nice. Yeah, I want to share that. Share that. <laughs> when I when I worked uh, in a when I worked in a Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, when I worked in a comic shop, uh, my buddy Justin, who worked with me, uh, he went to a, like a, a warehouse of comics. There's a comics warehouse in New York. And he went to a warehouse sale. And he was always big on like the quarter bins and just dating through the quarter bins and, and like buying, you know, 40 bucks worth of quarter bin books and just like reading them. And uh, he was there and he was like, hey, I just need you to like clarify that everything in this bin is a. Big quarter, on like, like a yeah. quarter bin. And he's like, anything I just pull out right now would be a quarter. And like, I was like, yeah, what are you stupid? And he's like, I just want to make sure that like, the, and he's like, no, everything is everything is as marked. And he's like, okay. And and because he'd gone through and there was a giant size X Men number one in there, and he pulled it out and was like, and the guy was like, that shouldn't have been in there. And he was like, well, I asked you, and I'm like, God damn it. And so the guy was like, give me two bucks. And I was like, why two bucks? Like <laughs> at that point. At that point, give it to him for a quarter and honor, and honor it. But just like, yeah, here's two bucks. And I was like, man, that I'm bummed. I did not pull that. Book. But he still has it. He loves it. So yeah, I mean, like I said, it's, that's my it's the best comic book, book ever. Besides maybe something you've written. Uh, no, that's definitely better than anything I've written. That, that, yeah, it's, it's, uh, so what what were some of your influences? Is I'll ask you one more question because I know we've uh, we kind of kept you for like an, like an half at this point. Uh, uh, but what's your all-time favorite X story? Because, I, I mean, we keep going back, going back to X-Men. You know, it's funny. I literally was talking to uh, James Tynan about this two days ago. Because um, he was rereading a bunch of X stuff, and, and we're talking, and he's a very close friend of mine. And we're talking, and I was like, yeah, X-Men is this weird thing because it doesn't work like other books. It's not about it's very rarely about a favorite issue or a favorite arc. Like it's, it's, it's a bigger picture than that. You sort of need to step away from X-Men for a year, like a, a story and look at a year's worth or two years worth. I mean, obviously the Claremont run is, is the defining thing. Um, you know, Fall of the Mutants was like uh, very, very much like to me when I was a kid, like my Uncanny X-Men run, Fall of the Mutants was a huge influence because to, when I was a kid, Fall of the Mutants was the book I read where, like, every other comic I read, you're like, oh, they're in danger. They're going to be okay next week, but, like, how do they get okay? Right. And Fall of the Mutants was the only book you read where you're like, I'm not sure they're going to be okay next week. Like, <laughs> right, right, right. I, I don't know if they're going to make it, like, and they didn't all make it, and now that was sort of the point. Um, so that, to me, is sort of what I always look to for X-Men, but, man, there's there's so many that I love, and... Uh, you know, I, I love all of Grant's run. I love Joss is astonishing, is huge to me. Um, and then there's weird ones like Ecstatics is like oh, yeah, one, yeah. One of my favorite. Um, Peter David X Factor, uh, the the detective stuff is a top five comic for me, easy. Um, but if I had to pick one thing, I'd pick all of these. Yeah. No, honestly, I mean, you mentioned uh, Justin Sweden, um, as astonishing. I think that for a long time. Uh, was like the gold standard, at least, at least for the like it or so, where you're like, like okay, I'm gonna start with, with X Men. This is a great, great place for you to start with these characters because it kind of, kind of reset for everybody. Um, yeah, yeah, he does a, He does an amazing job of, of resetting everything, but still acknowledging what came before. It's a real tightrope walk of like a love letter to the past, and but making that accessible. Um, I mean, the Kitty Colossus stuff like is so powerful, whether you understand Kitty and Colossus or not. It's so amazing. When he comes out, when she sees him for the first time, and he comes out, and you think he's running towards her, and he runs straight through her, and there's the panel of her just standing there, and she still has the same expression, and he's passed right through her because he's going to fight, is like one of the great comic moments. Like, sure. I think it, it really is up there. You know, and the, I have weird ones. I mean, I, I think the Bendis' issue of Ultimate X-Men, of Wolverine in the cave with the kid, um, is one of my favorite single issue comics of all time. Yeah. Like, it's always weird when you're like, oh, one of my favorite comics of all time is an issue of Ultimate X-Men. People are like, what? And then you're like, the issue with the kid in the cave. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's kind of perfect. I hadn't thought of that issue in like years until you said that. that, that, that bummer. I mean, that book is, book is that's, a, that, that's a great comic. Yeah, it's great. It's amazing. Um, 
Jason Aaron's first issue of Wolverine uh, is amazing. Uh, it's just Wolverine in a pit getting shot over and over for pages until he gets out of the pit. Uh, like stuff like that. Like there's things where you're like, well, it's not an arc of X-Men. It's just like these little moments, but like, I don't know. There's a ton of those that I really, really love. So. Awesome. All right, Matt, it's been great speaking with you. Um, this is really, really cool. I hope you stay safe. I mean, you are here, but uh, it sounds like you got some, some safety protocols in place. Sure. Yeah. My yeah. whole life. Like a curmudgeon, yeah. right? Like, right? Like that's a safety protocol. Yeah, um, exactly. But uh, uh, yeah, if you'd like to do this again, again, we'd love to have it. But again, stay safe. Keep making killer comic books. We're, we're, all, we're all big fans. Thank you so much for this. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. And, and keep keep selling books. I appreciate it. I, I mailed her some books last week. Hey, guys. So. Very cool. Awesome. Well, I hope you got there safely. Uh, you're, you're rock and roll, man. That's awesome. Very, very cool. Awesome. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Bye.